I got to tell you, raising this daughter, man, dad daughters, man, it is, woo, raising boys is easy. You can put them in the shed and lock that shed. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. But going back, Addie's always been pretty fierce. She's always been kind of like a firecracker. Here she is at maybe four or five years of age, pink hair, rock star. She would always, she had a season where she would always go, fireball, fireball. And mom and I were like, I don't know if we can take it. A loud voice, I don't know where she gets it from. She can go zero to 60 like that. Raise her voice all the time, that's odd. But she's always been a fireball. She's always been intense. You can see one of our first pumpkin fest back in the day, dad and ad, I think they got a photo. Bam, look at that. See, that's the intensity. Sometimes people would say those are crazy eyes for both people. But with Addie, we've always had to do something what we have to do with all of our children, this word called trust. Let's say trust all together. One, two, three, trust. Trust is a must in the parenting world, in the faith world. Trust is a pretty big word, and it's actually one of the first verses I learned about when I started following God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Let's say all together. One, two, three, all. Not some. But all, we like to trust in other things, someone, someplace, something. But God says, trust in him with all of your heart. This is Solomon writing, David's son, the wisest man supposedly who ever lived, says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and for all the new King James people in the house, and he shall direct your paths. You know it's King James, new King James, when there's a shall in there. But I have to make a decision God, I'm gonna trust in you. The next verse says, don't be wise in your own eyes. And so a lot of us, as we're living our lives, we have to decide, do we trust God or we don't trust him? We trust God with our kids, we trust God with our salvation, but there's some areas of our lives we really don't trust him. Like, let's just be honest, are there any areas of your life you're like, God, I just don't know if I can fully trust you. No one will lift their hands and confess, but I'll do it for you. We have a hard time. Sometimes there's just difficult things and we don't wanna really trust God with. And so today we're in this series called Pumpkins because we've all got pumpkins. I mean, we're in the pumpkin capital of the world if you're watching online, like 90% of all the pumpkins are because of Morton, Illinois. Right, Morton, Illinois, let's just, you're welcome. Let's just say it online, all the online people, you're welcome for the pumpkin chili, the pumpkin ice cream, the pumpkin bubble gum, the pumpkin something else, the pumpkin bread, the pumpkin soda. I mean, the list just goes on and on, you know? I mean, I think we've taken it a little bit too far. I mean, I've lived here for a while now. We've taken it just a bit too far with the pumpkins. But we all have pumpkins, and we have to tr- ask God, do we trust God with pumpkins? Brian, what do you mean we've all got pumpkins? You have a pumpkin who's now 18? No, I'm talking about your resources. I'm talking about your stuff. I'm talking about your possessions. I'm talking about your money. And people always get funny when you talk about money. It doesn't matter where you are, they just do. Because really, There's kind of this theory I've heard over the years. Sometimes people would say, like, the church always wants my money. Actually, that's a lie. The church is the only place you can go where you actually have to give nothing, and you can be welcomed, loved, accepted, cheered for, encouraged, grow in your gifts. Every store you go into wants your money. Every restaurant you go into, just go in in a restaurant today, eat the food, and then walk out to leave. Show me what happens. Just go test drive the vehicle today. I recommend a Volvo, a Lexus, a Tesla. Go go buy some, I mean, just go buy the Range Rover. You know what I'm saying? All blacked out, 22-inch rims. Go buy that today, or actually go test drive it, and don't return it, and see what happens. And when they pull you over, and you say, well, my pastor said just test drive it and keep it. No, please don't say that. Every organization in the world really wants your money. I would say the church has been the opposite, at least in my lifetime, is the place that you can actually experience freedom, grace, and all of this stuff. And being a Christ follower, you can't really talk about being a Christian unless you talk about financial terms. For example, Ephesians chapter one, verse seven. What does it say? It says, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. You've been purchased. I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ, church, that has done that for you and for me? (laughs) Ephesians 
1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted. And it says, after you've heard the word of truth, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. So when you receive Christ, you get the Holy Spirit of God, and you walk, and he gives you those promptings, and you follow him, and you let his leading lead you. He leads you to his truth. He leads you to his word. Yet some people, man, just the pumpkin thing, it just wrecks them. It just messes them up. And so what are you doing with your pumpkins? Are you trusting God with your pumpkins? Are you trusting him with your resources, with your stuff, with your money? And I don't know why this is a big deal because it's, for me, I'm like, ah, I don't know, God. Why is it such a big deal? Because God knows that this transaction thing, this money thing, he knows this whole topic can really mess us up because our treasure, wherever our treasure is, our heart follows Our heart follows that treasure. What's valuable to you? What's important to you? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things would be added. So Solomon was saying it a thousand years earlier. Jesus was repeating it. Hey, do you trust God? And I don't know why one out of 10 verses in the New Testament are dealing with possessions, money, and stuff. I don't know why Jesus talks more about money than heaven and hell combined. I don't know why Jesus talks about transactions and possessions and all of this stuff and all these things And things aren't wrong unless the things have you. Tap your neighbor and say, is that you? It's not bad to have nice stuff. Actually, God has given you things and given me things for our enjoyment, to enjoy life, to celebrate life. But this whole pumpkins thing can really mess us up. So what are you doing with the pumpkins? See, I've got up here one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten pumpkins. And how many am I have in my hand right now? One. And so for 27 years, I've said, okay, God, I'm gonna do what you want me to do. Because if you go back to the garden, Adam and Eve, remember Adam and Eve in the garden? The snake slithered in, and this is what he said. He said, did God really say that? Because today, many people, I guarantee you, I would bet on it, will leave today's talk and go, Does God really say that about my pumpkins? Does he really say that? And Adam and Eve, Eve listened to the serpent. The serpent slithered in and said, God told you not to eat from the divine portion, from the divine tree. And Eve said, well, did God really, or Satan said, did God really say that? You won't really die. And we've been doing the same thing for every topic our entire lives. Does God really say that? Does God really say that? And when we do what we want to do, Adam and Eve, we know she was duped. You don't know you've been deceived until you've been deceived. And then he said, a curse is going to follow you. They were in the garden. They were naked. They hid from God. And God can see everything. There's no bedroom, backroom, boardroom that God doesn't see. He knows everything that's happening. He knows the thoughts in your head. He knows what you feel about the pumpkins. He knows if you like this talk or you don't like this talk. Some of you are still thinking about taking the Range Rover for a test drive today and maybe not returning it. But God says, hey, I have a divine portion. Don't take from that divine portion. And those principles have been true ever since. See, I remember the first time I got paid. I was making seven fifty, seven fifty an hour, working kind of like a union job, maybe illegally, I don't know. They, I just did it. I'm like, okay, I'll do this, whatever. Working construction, which is humorous in itself. You know, I mean, I'm what you call a yuppie. That's okay. I'm okay. I've embraced that life. I'm okay with that. My idea of roughing it's the Marriott Hotel. One day, hopefully, the Four Seasons. And so, but I was doing this job, and I got paid. And then I learned this four-letter F word, FICA. Ugh. And the government does a good job of taking our portion. You know what I'm saying? They're like, you ever just get paid? You're like, whoa, okay. They need this more than I do? Maybe not. But FICA takes some, the government takes some, all of these resources, then you see what you have left, and then you gotta make a decision. Are you going to give God the divine portion back? Are you gonna go, no, God, I'm I'm keeping it all? I mean, I just think that's crazy. A lot of people, their perception is, man, why do I have to give God my wealth? Doesn't God own everything anyways? Yeah, he does. Everything, God owns it. So why do I have to give it to him? Well, you have to see, do you trust him? Do you trust him with the resources? Instead of saying, why do I have to give God my wealth? The real question is, why does God say, you know what? 
I'll give you 90, you just give me 10. See, a lot of us are like, man, God, I gotta give you 10? Instead, we should be asking God, God, why do you do the opposite of what I would do? Because didn't, when it comes to your sin, Jesus take all of your worst and you got his best? God gave you Jesus, his best, and you traded it for your worst. You gave God all of your lust, all of your selfishness, all of your greed, all of your sin that put him on the cross, and God said, I'll give you my best, Jesus. I'm thankful God gave us his best. Aren't you thankful that God gave us his best? And you can go, look, do your research, do your study, this divine principle of the first. God always takes the first, all the way back to the garden. God had a portion. The first, when they conquered the cities in Joshua, they went in to take the city, and they were supposed to leave all the stuff because it was God's. It was the first. Jesus is God's tithe. He's the first. And so you see this principle over and over. And so just real quickly, when it comes to our giving, this is, this is what happens. We have to ask ourselves, what do we wanna do with the first? And this is God's promise. And one thing I know, God's promises never fail. We sang about it today. God's promises never fail. Has God ever failed you? I mean, maybe you're still waiting on a promise to come true, but it says in Malachi chapter three, verse 10, for all the people from Italy, some people call him Malachi. I just think that's funny. But Malachi, the prophet, he said, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And this is the only verse in the Bible. I love this. I love looking at your amazing faces right now. Some of you are like freaked out. You're like, am I eating God's divine portion? I don't know, maybe you're driving it, maybe you're living in it. But he says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing. Many of the blessings I've received have been tangible, yet some of them money can't buy. The health of your children, surviving 18 years with one daughter, four boys, I mean, all of these things. Man, we can't, a lot of the blessings that God has given us, health and favor and and being with us in our most difficult seasons. But we gotta decide, God, do I wanna keep your divine portion? And where do you bring it? Into the storehouse, that's your local place of worship. Jesus doesn't say, hey, take it to a charity. He doesn't say, take it to an organization, a nonprofit, give it to somebody else. Yes, those are things. Yet a tithe is a tenth. So every $10 you get, you return $1 to God. I've been doing this for 27 years, and I'm telling you, God is faithful above and beyond anything you can ask or imagine. He'll take care of you, he'll provide for you. The verse before that, if you really wanna do your homework, says, will a man or woman rob God? I've been robbed before. Woo! Call the police department. You ever been robbed? Feel so violated? I mean, they only took my baseball cards but I felt robbed as a junior hire. God says, will a man rob God? He says, because you do this, <laughs> you're under a curse. Ooh. You're under a curse, the people of God were robbing him and now they're under a curse, their finances are under a curse. God's saying, okay, you don't need me. You got this figured out, you do it your way. And, and let me encourage you, when you give, that doesn't mean you can be reckless with your big budget. You gotta have a big budget and you cannot lie. You gotta put the notes down, you gotta manage, you can't be a bad budgeteer, if you will. You gotta decide, God, I'm bringing you the first portion. And some of you never know the floodgates of heaven because you've never sowed, you've never actually done this. I see people who've been serving God for 20 years, they don't do this. God loves them. He cares about them, yet this is a massive principle in the scriptures, like go to what God says. Adam and Eve in the garden. Lucifer in the garden, did God really say that? Does God really say that? And if you just kind of navigate through all the Old Testament and the principles, you'll see in the New Testament, the tithe, Jesus, Matthew 23, 23, he's telling the religious leaders, yes, you should tithe, but tithing is more than that. God has called you and me to be generous, to be givers, because we love God. Remember on the Sermon on the Mount when he said, do not murder anyone? He took it farther. He said, don't hate anybody. He said, do not commit adultery. Well, he said, don't lust in your heart. When it comes to giving, the benchmark, a tithe, is for Christians, we should be starting. The tithe is not really generosity. And one thing I would apologize to many people over the years, I don't know if I've taught that well. 
This is what the tithe is. But let me, let me challenge you just on your giving. When you give, what should happen? Number one, Deuteronomy 14, 23, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. Because when you get paid, you get to see who's first real fast. I mean, you just get to see. Do you trust him? God wants us to be cheerful. Let's all smile real quick. Just take a photo here, whether it's fake or whether it's real for me. Cheerful. God wants you to be a cheerful giver. God wants you to be a generous giver. And this is maybe the one where I've messed up and missed it. When it comes to sacrificial, Leviticus 27.30 says that a tithe of everything, a tithe of everything, let's say everything, one, two, three, everything. That's a tenth, that's a tithe of everything. Here it is, belongs to the Lord, it is holy. It's holy to the Lord. And so I've over the years said, hey, give a tenth, trust God, it's in the book, it's what we do, it advances God's kingdom, it advances his agenda. Yet a lot of people, I forgot to tell them, hey, you realize when you take this and you drive it and you vacation with it and you eat it, you're taking what's holy from God. Now, a lot of people don't dig that, but if you go check it out, when they went into that city with Joshua and they conquered Jericho, and then, or they went in, they had conquered the other cities, they went to this, this, this city, they got wiped out. Why? Because a guy took, his name was Achan, and the whole nation of Israel was aching after he stole that tithe from God. And some of us were like, man, are you, are you stealing that tithe? Are you taking that tithe? But above that, today I wanna talk not just about trust, not just about giving, but I wanna talk about this law of reaping and sowing. Because the reality is, this pumpkin, a farmer, if he grows pumpkins, they put a seed in the ground, he gets a pumpkin, right? Stay with me, class. He gets a pumpkin. If he sows the seeds of pumpkins, he gets a pumpkin back. But he gets something much more. He gets seeds in that pumpkin. And today, I want you to think about reaping and sowing, not karma. There's a seed. There it goes. Seeds. We get to sow into the kingdom of God, and we get to reap back. Because there's the law of reaping and sowing. Like, you can't beat it. It's just a reality in all of our lives. And there's four principles I want you to take down. The first one, because I know you're taking notes. You'll memorize these. You ready? Are you ready? Let's try it. Because why am I so blessed? After 27 years, I'll just tell you, you're blessed too. Many of you could come up here on a microphone and say, man, I've trusted God. I have, I've trusted him with the holy tithe. And then he's expanded me and challenged me to be generous. But number one is you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So whatever I sow, that's what I'm gonna reap. If I sow working away from my family, I'm not gonna sow and I'm not gonna reap a great family. If I reap negative attitudes in the workplace, I'm probably not gonna move forward in my future in the workplace. We reap what you sow. This is much bigger than our finances. This is our attitude. This is mercy. You give people mercy when they don't deserve it. Why? Because one day you're gonna need it. Reaching the lost and loving the least. Loving the least and reaching the lost. This is about us leaving a legacy, not when we're dead, but right now. And so for our church, we're taking care of two organizations. We're partnering, if you will, with two organizations. HRI, an orphanage in Haiti. Haiti is such in disarray. The economy is so bad. The immorality is so bad. The gangs are so bad. Our orphanage that is far away from safety, which has been good, they had to almost Navy SEAL our kids out of our orphanage because all of the supplies that were going there, no one could get them there. The gangs are in the government. Man, they need a miracle from God. They need divine intervention. They also need people to step up. World nations, the United States, to actually do something. So we still provide food and meals and medical supplies for them. We also partner with God Behind Bars, which at Christmas season, we just believe everybody should get a gift. Yeah. And parents who are incarcerated, we get to help those parents connect with their kids and have a great Christmas. I don't know, I think Jesus 
would be behind that? Anybody else think Jesus might be behind that, might be in that? Good work. But then also, it's about a second location. It's about, for us in the coming years, as we raise the resources to reach people, we want to depopulate hell and populate heaven. We want to create reservations in heaven. That's what I want to live my life for. That's what I want my legacy to be about. Not only do I want to take care of the poor, not only do I want to do stuff for people who can never pay me back, I want to do stuff for people who are far from God, who are lost. Because I know that there's other Brian's in other cities who are looking for purpose. Just as you were reached, the ultimate question is, will you do something to reach others back? That's the ultimate test when your life has been changed. But you sow seeds. And so we had this God goal of over $250,000 of generosity. That's above regular giving. That's a lot of coin. There's probably some people in here today that could probably write a check for half of that. I mean, I'm just saying. There's some people who have been blessed with so much pumpkin. Like, you know it. You've just been blessed with pumpkin. And you, you, this whole time, your whole life, as God has changed you, you've, you've still, you've, you've given him like half the tithe. Or some, you, you've given him the tithe, but it's almost become legalistic because God doesn't want us to be legalistic Christians. I mean, I can be legalistic. Like, okay, God, here's your, here's your it's holy. Well, Brian, I've called you to something much greater. I've called you to generosity. I've called you to give above and beyond yourself. And the fact is, until I plant seeds, I can never reap a harvest. If I hold on to what I have and I never sow to where I wanna go, see right now there's a field for your future. You're hearing this talk, there is a field for your future. If you don't like where you are financially, spiritually, emotionally, right now you have the opportunity before you leave today to say, God, I'm gonna sow some seed. I'm gonna sow some seed into a better attitude. God, I'm gonna sow some seed into trusting you with my pumpkins. And I just find it interesting. People are like, it's my pumpkin. I'm keeping my pumpkin. <sighs> I mean, I've seen some mean Christians. And I've seen those one Christians, they like placate. I think that's the right word. I'll just say they fake it. They're like, man, I love this place. I love this church. This church has changed my life. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Location two, we're gonna snatch people from hell. I'm going to hell with a water pistol. Who's coming with me? Ah! Like, I love this place. Man, we're giving. This church is growing. This is the best church in sliced bread. And they're walking through. They're like, man, I hope no one sees that I'm taking God's pumpkin. It's holy to the Lord. Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it. I'm worshiping. But really... What many people have done to reach you, you don't trust God to reach others. Galatians 6, 9 tells us, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So not only do you reap what you sow, you reap where you sow. If you take care of God's house, I can promise you this, God will take care of your house. If there's any principle I can stand on, if you take care of God's house, God will take care of your house. But you reap what you sow after you sow it. After you sow it. There is a time, and then you gotta wait. You gotta put the seed in the ground, then you gotta wait. And a lot of people, they, they start waiting, and they can't wait any longer. And God says in verse 10 to, Galatia, to the Galatians, he says, we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. That verse before that, that I went very quickly on, said, at the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. I watched people start giving, okay, Brian, I trust God with, it's his tithe, I trust him with it, but then I had the washer break and I had all this other stuff break. It takes faith to trust God. And again, Christianity is a bunch of financial terms. Purchased, redeemed, bought back, a deposit, a down payment, it's been finished. It's been paid. Christianity, there's financial terms, and we always get the better end of the deal. And God says, hey, I want to know, do you really trust me with every area of your life? Not only do we reap after we sow, the final one, you always reap more than you sow. You always reap more than you sow. Until you allow God to change your mind through principles, you'll always be stuck in the same pattern. That's for someone today. You have been stuck in a financial pattern your whole life. You have trusted yourself. You have trusted your own works. You have trusted your own intellect. And you get into a pattern. 
and you don't sleep with peace. I've noticed that sometimes people with a lot of stuff are very fearful of losing their stuff. Man, when I lay it on my bed at night, I'm like, man, we gotta pay for those teeth again? We gotta, we gotta pull those teeth? I'll pull them out right now with some pliers. I know some people. I have a friend who knows a friend. But when I lay my head on my pillow at night, my house is protected. I've got the provision of God. I've got the favor of God. I've gone, I've been corrected by God. I've been redirected by God. I trust him with the first, the holy thing of God. And God watches over me. And he has poured out countless times over and over again so much blessing that you can't contain it. The same promises that were true for those people, they're true for us today. Yeah. I don't give to get. I give because I trust God. It's a part of my faith journey. If I can trust him with my kids, whoa, my resources, that's an easy thing for me. For me, it may be easy. For you, you may have grown up with this, this mindset, this poverty mindset. I don't believe God has that for you and for me. He's a good father who watches after you. He knows all of your needs. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going through. Even right now, maybe you're married to someone who's against trusting God and you wanna trust God and you just have to have those conversations and you have to walk through that and you have to go, hey, what if we trust God? Could our lives be actually different? You give God time, you sow the seed of generosity, you bring back the tithe, you sow the seed, you wait and you just be faithful and you just be faithful and whatever it is you've been praying for, you're trusting God. Sometimes we're trusting God for children, maybe you can't have children. Sometimes we're trusting God, you wanna, you wanna get married, you're single. Sometimes we're trusting God for a new job. Sometimes we're trusting God for, for some breakthrough in your marriage, some breakthrough in your life. I'm telling you, there is a power that happens when you put this principle into action in your life. I'm just telling you, it's just a reality. You always reap more of what you sow. Second Corinthians 9, 6 says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly, will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. It's interesting, isn't it? We see trust God, trust God, trust God all the time. We've even got it on our money. Can I tell you how difficult it was today to find someone that had a dollar bill in their pocket? <laughs> but on the back of a dollar, it says, in God, we trust. This is comical. This is hilarious to me. Most people should rewrite that and say, in this I trust. I trust in this. I don't trust God with this. I trust in this more than God. Are you kidding me? What do you trust? Do you trust him with your pumpkins? Don't worry, the offering's already been taken today. There's no second offering. It's just a question. Do you trust him? Money, possessions, it's, it's a spiritual issue. I think Jesus talked about it because he wanted us to see, do you trust what I say? Do you trust what someone else says or do you trust what you say? And I've been doing this long enough and I've watched people do this long enough who say, God, God, here's, this is holy. This is automatic, this is, goes to you. God, it's time for me to be generous. God, I'll give you this. And I feel the Holy Spirit prompting me, okay, God, I have more for you. Lord, I don't know how we'll do it. You gotta take care of those teeth. But I've watched in Danielle and I's life the more generous we've been before. See, you have to sow to go into your future. You have to sow what you don't have now because that's the faith thing. Even as a church, you need to know this. We support other churches. We give generously to other churches and they don't give us anything in return. We sow into people who can never repay us because we trust God. God has been generous to us. We wanna be generous with others. Are you thankful that you're part of a church that's bigger than just their small little church? We're about the kingdom of God. And so it really comes down to where do you, where do you wanna go? If you like the field, you're in right now. Stay in that field. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. We're gonna keep sowing. I want my kids to see us write radical generosity numbers down to God's house, to be radically generous to other people. 
And they say, well, where are we going to come up with this? The Lord. Because that's the faith element. See, for 18 years, all the way back to when she was four and five years of age, I was trusting Addie. When she was praying in that e-kids room, I've trusted God all these years. I trust today. She's 18. But it all comes back to that word, trust. Do you trust him? So today, that's my prayer for you and for me. That as you see the goodness of God, that you trust him with the holy tithe. But you let God do an amazing work in your heart. And if this is one of those areas that you're like, Brian, I've just, I've struggled with this because of how I was raised. I've struggled with this my entire life. Just ask God, God, did you really say that? Because if you really did, and God, there's a seed harvest out there. God, today I wanna be the first one to sign up and sow seeds into the lives of others, into your house. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for your truth. God, there's so many people here that have an unbelievable harvest ahead of them. I pray that they see that harvest on this side of eternity, and then many will see it one day. Thank you for so many who have been so faithful to bring back your holy tithe, who have trusted you with generosity, the goodness of God, you've been so good to them, and they wanna be good to others. God, we love you, we thank you. God, I believe that the Holy Spirit is gonna work in hearts today, and my prayer for you today is that the Holy Spirit of God works in your heart, works in your life, and as you hear the word of God, Galatians and Corinthians and the Apostle Paul talking about you reap what you sow. Ask yourself that, God, where do I wanna go? Because wherever you're reaping, that's where you're gonna sow. You sow into this world, that's what you reap. You sow into the spiritual things of God, that's what you'll reap. And I'm telling you, with all of my heart, all of my life, you take care of God's house. God will always, and he always takes care of your house. Father, we love you. We thank you for this word today. God, I need to hear it. I need to be encouraged that, Lord, I'm sowing into a great future. And then, Lord, we trust you with our resources. For those that struggle and they battle with this Holy Spirit, work in their hearts, soften their hearts. May they realize this faith journey, it's an adventure. It's an adventure of letting go. And maybe this is something they need to let go of to learn that they would trust you with all their heart. Lean not on their own understanding, but acknowledge you in all their ways. And if they do that, God, you shall direct their paths. If you're here today and you'd be honest and say, hey, Brian, you're talking about resources, you're talking about my pumpkins, and I feel distant from God. How do I get right with God? Well, the Bible makes it very clear. You humble yourself, you turn to God. You say, God, I believe that you died on a cross 2,000 years ago. Today I'm in church, I feel distant from you, and it's our sin that keeps us distant from him. And maybe you need to turn back to him. Maybe you've wandered away from him. You just humble yourself. Make this your prayer. Just say, Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me today. Give me a brand new start. Forgive me of all of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on that cross. He was buried and he rose again. And today I wanna choose Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. If that's you right where you are, just tell him, Jesus, I choose you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, that deposit. Lord, I thank you that you purchased all of my sin and all of my shame. I gave you my worst, you gave me your best. God, I gladly receive with a cheerful heart. Help me to live my life to the best of my ability all my days for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, come on, church, if they made that decision, let's welcome in the God's family.